Hello there, everybody. This is Alan Blumkin on the Comfortably Zone Radio Network. Uh, I'm here today with David Nemec and another chapter of uh, David Nemec's uh, Old Time History and Trivia. And there's a diversion from the usual uh, team histories that we've been doing. We're going to discuss one of the most interesting eras in baseball, uh, the 1890s. Okay, where you had the uh, 12-team National League, where you had a number of rule changes, a couple of dominant teams, and uh, syndication where baseball owners were able to own more than one team in the league, which led to the uh, uh, indirectly to the formation of the American League and the uh, cutting of uh, the National League from 12 to 8 teams. Welcome, David. Thank you, Al. Pleasure to be with you again. Okay, as uh, you know, we discussed uh, earlier, the 1890s really started in 1891, uh, which was the uh, seen the uh, end of the one-year players' league, where most of the ball players returned to their in- their initial teams, and uh, the demise of the American Association. Uh, yeah, some did not return to their. Uh teams prior, the team they uh, were with in 1889, uh, primarily players like Harry Stovey and Lou, and Lou Bierbauer, and that uh, for, uh, caused the American Association to withdraw from the national agreement because they felt that they were being deprived of players that technically, uh, by rule, should have come back to the Philadelphia American Association team and did not. And when they withdraw from the uh, withdrew from the national agreement, uh, that made them more or less an outlaw league in 1891, and uh, put an end to the uh, what had been an annual World Series between the American Association and National League, uh, beginning in 1884. Uh, the last series took place in 1890 and 1891, uh, which was a very complex year in Major League Baseball. Uh, probably, uh, we can almost say, say safely that, uh, the pennant was rigged for the, uh, Boston Beaners to win, uh, and Chicago to lose because Chicago's Cap Anson had said that if we win the pennant, we will, uh, forgo, uh, the war with the American Association. We will play the American Association champion. And once he made that proclamation, he was unpopular anyway for not being part of the Players League, uh, the 1891 season dissolved in chaos in the National League, and uh, charges were brought that the pennant was thrown. And uh, although the charges were fairly well established, uh, to be very credible and even more, uh, nothing was ever done about it. The pennant was ultimately awarded to Boston. Uh, The two leagues went to war after the season, and the uh, upshot was that the American Association and National League uh, in December of 1891 <clears throat> agreed to merge into one league called uh, the National League and American Association of Major League Baseball Players. Nobody ever used that name uh, throughout the 90s, even though technically that was the official name of the league. It was called simply the National League and remained that way. Uh, the, Le- the league, National League, absorbed four uh, teams from the American Association to uh, uh, swell into a 12-team organization, which was very unwieldy. And the uh, first season that the 12-team, the 12-team league played was 19, 1892, which coincidentally, uh, due to the way the schedule was set up, uh, was the first season in which 154 games were played, scheduled. Uh, yeah, one, uh, yeah, one thing, uh, for those of you in the uh, listening audience who were uh, aware of the split season uh, after the 1981 strike, that was not the first time. Uh, if I remember correctly, 1892 was a split season was because it was a lengthy season and yeah. it uh it was divided into two 77 uh game chapters and at the end of the 77th game uh the season one winner was declared and that was Boston 
in the in the second half of the season, Cleveland, which had not been a very strong team in the first half, uh, other teams, Philadelphia for one, were playing better ball in the first half than Cleveland. Uh, Cleveland ran away with the second half of the season, uh, creating a postseason series between uh, the winners of the two halves of the season, Boston and Cleveland, and Boston won the series. Um, this was uh, the 154th game season was immediately dispensed with after that. Uh, it, was the, it was thought to be too unwieldy, uh, lasting too long, and they went back to um, 132 games, and each team played, uh, let's see, there were 12 teams, each team played every other team. Uh, 11 times. Yeah, 11 times. Yeah. And um, as you can see, uh, just by the number 11, uh, there were, the scheduling was imbalanced. Uh, there were a lot of things about the 12 team National League that were unpopular and, um, made for att attendance problems, salary problems, all kinds of problems throughout the 90s. But during the course of the 90s, as, as Al has mentioned, uh, two teams in particular and a third team, uh, very close to joining them, uh, became the very, the dominant teams throughout the throughout the decade. Uh, the two two teams that were definitely the, among the, the the dominant teams were Baltimore and Boston, <clears throat> and the third team, Cleveland, uh, ironically was right there with them through most of the decade. Uh, but toward the end of the decade, when attendance was became a huge problem, uh, we've talked about that in the past when we talked about. Uh, the Cleveland Indians franchise, that attendance was really a problem uh, in the early days of Cleveland baseball. Uh, the Cleveland team uh, could not keep up with Boston and uh, Baltimore toward the end of the 90s. And as Al has mentioned, syndicate baseball came into being uh, with the Cleveland owners uh, realizing that they could not make a go of it. And Cleveland bought the St. Louis club in addition to their own club and transferred all of their best players, mostly you know, players like Cy Young and Jesse Burkett, uh, future Hall of Famers, to the St. Louis franchise uh, in the expectation that St. Louis would then become a premier team, uh, which it did after being a drag throughout the, throughout the 1890s. So, but Baltimore and Boston, meanwhile, uh, Boston won, really won, uh, most games of any team in the National League in the 1890s, all told. Uh, Baltimore is considered by historians to be uh, the most prominent team, even though they weren't necessarily the strongest team throughout the 90s, because they had a fantastic run uh, from 94 to 96. They won three straight pennants. They were loaded with Hall of Famers, uh, John McGraw, you know, Huey Jennings, Joe Kelly, uh, the, the manager, Ned Hanlon. Wilbur Robinson. Yeah, yeah, Wilbur Robinson. Uh, Willie and they Keeler. Had Willie Keeler. Yeah. And they had, they had good ball players at every position. They didn't have a weak spot. But um, we could talk about the teams, or we can, we can also, we also should digress a bit to talk about uh, how the game changed in the 90s. Well, my 1893 uh, was the, uh, the major change was uh, the moving of the, uh, uh, pitcher's mound back from 50 feet to 50, six, the current 60 feet, 6 inches, and the pitchers used to have a box, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, they were able to do whirling dervish things and dancing in the box, and they had to, uh, you know, they had to learn how to tow the rubber and do all the things that, you know, the current day pitchers use. Yeah, the 1893, uh, pitching rules changed. Uh, didn't, didn't, didn't increase the distance all that much because the pitcher, when he landed on his front foot, uh, was, was 50 feet from the plate and, you know, but he started 55, really, it, it lengthened the distance five feet. It'd be very, in, in a little bit difficult to explain it without drawing pictures. Uh, but it only was an increase in five feet in distance and as Al said, a slab or a rubber was introduced. And the pitcher had to have one foot anchored to that rubber. Uh, previously, he had to have come to a complete stop with one, you know, before he delivered the pitch. That rule came in in 1887. 
and is considered by some uh, to be the uh, pivotal year as a result, 1887, when modern baseball came into existence. Because prior to then, pitchers were allowed to dance to, to start out uh, instead of facing the batter. They have their back to the batter. They run. They take a step. They're jumping steps. Some even jumped. Uh, there was a pitcher jumping Jack Jones who would take a running start then leap into the air and fire the ball toward home plate. Uh, that was abolished in 1892 when pitcher, the pitchers had to have, uh, in 1893 rather, when pitchers had to have one foot anchored, anchored firmly. And that eliminated um, a pitch that uh, Silver King and uh, Kid Carsey in particular uh, featured, which was a, a crossfire. They would start at one corner of the rectangular box and cross the box uh, running, you know, parallel uh, to uh, the plate and then release the ball at the other corner of the box after planting one foot and then just firing the ball across their bodies. That pitch uh, was no was abolished. And there were some other... Yeah, several pitchers didn't uh, find themselves unable to make the adjustment, but uh, you know, the two uh, premier pitchers of that era, Cy Young and Kid Nichols, uh, uh, seemed to have done that without losing any sort of effectiveness. As, as did Amos Rusey, who was yeah. a truth artist and was a, uh, uh, re, uh, registered, generally registered the most strikeouts in a season, along with the most walks. But he uh, he didn't have trouble adjusting. Young didn't have trouble adjusting. Nichols didn't. But pitchers who threw mostly breaking balls did because their their breaking balls were geared uh, to break break from a shorter distance, and uh, some of them just couldn't make the transition. Uh, Gus Wang, in particular, his ball now broke too. You know, when when they went to the 1883 rule, his ball now broke too early, and uh, his career was curtailed as a result. He made adjustments finally and came back to be a fair pitcher, not not the great pitcher he was prior to, prior to 1893. But some interesting interesting other rule changes came into being. One uh, we should talk definitely talk about is the infield fly rule. Uh, which uh, came into existence really in the, uh, 1894 and created all sorts and created you know a number of interesting problems right off the bat. Uh, in 1894, um, the rule became if, if uh, uh, first base was occupied. First, you know, first base, second base. First, first base was occupied with less than two out, uh, and an infield fly was hit. That the at the uh, infield pop fly was hit. The batter was automatically out, and if the ball landed, landed even if the ball landed safely, he was out. If it uh, if it did, and if it wasn't caught, caught, he could move up if he if he thought he could make it. Uh, however, that rule was tested immediately uh, by a third baseman named Arlie Latham uh, in one of the early games of the season. A pop fly was hit in his direction, and instead of pick, instead of even making an attempt to catch it, he just picked it up, tossed it to the pitcher, and the umpire, who was a guy named Jack McQuaid, said, "Well." You know, the, you didn't catch it, so there's not an, you, you, the batter isn't out. Unfortunately, the rule did not read that the ball had to be caught. All it, all it said was that the umpire declared infield five, the batter was automatically out. So the fielders didn't even have to make an attempt at that point. That rule was addressed, that rule change was addressed, and it became, you know, closer to the rule we have today. Uh, but it, that rule was put in primarily to not only eliminate a possible double play, uh, and if a pop fly was in the infield, but a possible triple play. There were several triple plays registered where the, uh, shortstop, third baseman, or second baseman would deliberately let a ball drop with runners on first and second base. Uh, if it was near second base, the second baseman would just, you know, rush over and tag the runner on second base, then tag tag the you know, tag the bag and then throw throw the first base and retire the batter. And uh, there were several triple plays registered that way and it, it became kind of silly and ridiculous and finally that rule was changed. Uh 
Other significant rule changes that don't get much attention today also occurred in 1894. Uh, one, for the first time, a batter was ass assessed a strike on a foul bunt attempt, but only if it was a, an attempt at a sacrifice hit. If it was an attempt to bunt fair and beat it out, it was not considered a foul strike. And the, the, there were no such things really as foul strikes at that point. Only, and only on a bunt attempt was one ever assessed if the ball went foul. Uh, that rule was changed uh, the following year, and it now read that if a batter made an attempt to bunt the ball and it went foul, he was assessed a strike. Uh, but it had to be a gen it had to be clearly a bunt attempt. If it was just if it was a swinging bunt and it went foul, it was still not a foul ball. Uh, that rule affected two uh, 1890s batting champions very, very severely, Billy Hamilton and Hugh Duffy, uh, both of whom had hit over, over, over 400 in 1894. Uh, Duffy, in fact, hit 440 in 1894, which is, which is considered the, the all-time record for the highest average in the season. And by 1895, however, Ducky, Duffy started to decline, and he declined rapidly throughout the 1890s, so that by the end of the century, he was no longer much of an offensive factor in the game. And the reason was that Duffy, Duffy used to specialize in bunts, uh, bunting foul, bunting foul, bunting foul, until he either got a pitch he wanted, or if he, or he drew a walk. And Hamilton was much the same. Hamilton, uh, ha Duffy had some power. Uh, Hamilton had very little. Hamilton could get a, could get doubles, stretch doubles into triples, but hit very few home runs. Duffy did have power. If he got a pitch to his liking, could drive it out. But their batting averages shrunk correspondingly. Uh, they were never factors again in a in a batting in a batting title race. And indeed, their uh, career batting average has shrunk correspondingly, uh, dramatically in Duffy's cage. Not so much in, in Hamilton's, because Hamilton was really a better, better all-around hitter, and probably a better all-around ball player. Now, but, I know in 1894, the uh, uh, entire Philadelphia outfield of Hamilton, Ed Dallahanty, and uh, Sam Thompson uh, all hit over 400. And their fourth outfielder, a uh, switch hitter named Tuck Turner, uh, who filled in were never needed uh, for one of the three if they had to sit out a game or, uh, you know, were injured during the course of a game. Uh, Tuck Turner also hit over 400. So you had four, four batting title qualifiers for, among the, in, in the Philadelphia outfield, all of whom were 400 hitters. Uh, after that season, only Delahanty, who was really the best hitter of of of, of the four, uh, ever again approached 400 and actually did top 400 on one occasion. But uh, Thompson, uh, Hamilton, and Turner never really never approached 400 again. And speaking of you know uh, an injury replacement during the course of the game, that too came into existence earlier in the 1890s. Uh, for the first time, prior to the uh, prior to the 1890s, a substitute could only be made if a player was injured, and then the opposing manager had to agree that the injury was sufficient to allow for a substitution to be made. If he disagreed, and the umpire also did not side with the uh, injured team's uh, injured team's manager who was asking for uh, substitution. Then that, that injured player either had to remain in the game or his team had to play a man short. But once uh, substitutions uh, were allowed, they were allowed at the end of an inning. Then they began, to, and there was only one allowed a game. Then there were two allowed a game, and it, it gradually grew into the rule we knew today. Uh, but when did three, subst three substitution really occur? Uh, by the end of the 90s, but it, it, uh, it had some glitches along the way. Uh, for, for example, uh, there was nothing, you know, the pinch hitters were, were allowed for the first time in the 1890s for a player who was not injured. But no stipulation was made 
when that pitch hit, pinch hit or had to enter the game. So if a batter started, uh, uh, you, you want you, you put your pitcher up to bat and he got behind an 0 and 2 account, and you decided you wanted to replace him. Uh, you then ran into a problem with the umpire and with the opposing team. Could you replace him? Uh, could you replace the pitcher? Or could you replace anybody, indeed, in, in the batting order if he had already dr- drawn a count? Uh, there was nothing in the rules to cover it. So the umpires were, you know, scrambling around, forced to make decisions, you know, catch as catch can. And sometimes they were wrong, sometimes they were right, or sometimes they didn't draw a protest, and the protest could get very physical. Uh, and rules, rules as a result were being revised and refined and changed every year. Uh, and umpires, of course, um, had a tough time keeping up with them. They were making mistakes. Uh, they made the, a big rule change uh, occurred in 1897. Uh, Prior to 1897, because of two players in particular, Kurt Welch and Jay Fotts, who used to delight in getting hit by pitches by sticking up their hands uh, at the last second as the pitch would come in when, the, when, the, when there were no runners on base and the catchers were with no runners on base, the catcher would play deep behind the plate. He had no reason to play up close. And the umpire would then be set himself behind the catcher. And uh, Fox and Welch, uh, would take advantage of that by holding up their hand at the last minute and pretending it hit their hand. And the umpire, you know, seeing, or, or actually, you know, or what they would do actually, they would start out by faking a bunt and draw the catcher out from behind the plate. He'd come charging out from behind the plate to cover the, the seeming bunt that was going to occur. And then once the catcher moved from behind the plate, they would then stick up their hand and allow the ball to hit their hand. And the umpire would usually award them their base because he really, because he, his own safety was being protected when they held up their hand. The ball wasn't going to hit him because the catcher was no longer in position to catch it. And uh, a rule was put in that in 18, you know, I believe in 1890, 91 or 92, that a ball, a pitch ball who hit a batter in the forearm or in the hand was not the batter was not given his base. He had to be hit in the shoulder or in the elbow or in, in the in midsection or some other part of his body. And that rule led to a lot of ridiculous kinds of occurrences, including an 1896 uh, game in which uh, Brooklyn second baseman uh, Tom Daly was hit in the wrist and it broke his wrist. And he was not allowed to take his base until he convinced the umpire that he wasn't hit in the wrist but hit in the shoulder. And immediately uh-huh. yeah, upon taking, his, yeah, taking his base, he was taken out of the game because he couldn't play with a broken wrist. So to avoid those kinds of ridiculous situations where umpires were made to look very foolish, they restored the old rule where a, a pitch ball, if a pitch ball hit a batter any part of his body or uniform, he was given his base. But uh, the rules were very much in flux. And, uh, uh, you know, curiously, uh, we were talking about catchers coming out from behind the plate or playing deep behind the plate uh, when uh, when there was nobody on base. If a I catcher didn't have played, shin guards in those days. They didn't have shin guards, right, no. and the chest protectors were rudimentary and the gloves yeah. and the mitts were not that terrific. So what they would do, uh, if a batter hit a, a foul tip, and the catcher was playing deep behind the bat. Uh, the batter was out. The batter was out on a foul tip, deep behind the bat. But if the catcher was playing close behind the bat, where a foul tip was easier to catch, the batter was not out. Not only that, but he was not even assessed to strike because a foul tip was not. There were no. There were no foul ball rule at that point. So this got to some, you know, discrepancies. Was the catcher playing deep enough when he caught the, when he caught the foul tip? Was he playing too close to the batter? There were huge arguments. You know, the game would be stopped. The players, would, you know, there was no replay. There was nothing. You know, the umpire, the poor umpire, was, you know, he had his own himself as his only witness that he could call on, and oftentimes he didn't see the play that clearly. 
So he again would he'd make decisions that were un, going to be unpopular one way or the other. Finally, that rule uh, was made much much simpler. A foul, foul tip caught. Uh, most, of the, you know, most of the time, they had uh, only one umpire in the games, and uh, you know, especially with the old Orioles, there was a number of instances where uh, uh, they would hide uh, baseballs in the uh, deep grass in the outfield. There were times that McGraw was notorious for pulling uh, the belts of runners trying to round, opposing runners trying to round third, and uh, uh, this one also about the. Uh, uh, players uh, going from first to third without uh, uh, stopping to go to second, cutting, you know, c- cutting across the diamond. Cutting across the diamond, and uh, there's all, you know. And, so did they have uh, two umpires before the 19th century, and and did, uh, that did not come in until uh, the 20th century? The, the, the American Association, which was you know much more progressive in a lot of ways experimented with the two umpires. They had two umpires in the World Series uh, between the American Association and the National League. Um, they started that in about 1886, <clears throat> and that continued. But they didn't have them in regular season games, although the American Association experimented with the two umpire system in 1888, and it worked fairly well. Uh, it's, it's, it's still a mystery to, to most historians why uh, once the American Association successfully uh, introduced two umpires, why they reverted to having it's only a single umpire, and the National League uh, mostly had single umpires throughout the 1890s until the latter part of the decade, uh, when they finally started to to try to go to a two umpire system, and it wasn't until um, in the, in, the, in the 20th century that they went to a three-umpire system, and the four-umpire system didn't come in until really around the Second World War. Yeah, that... So, and the idea of having umpires yeah. on the foul lines and all that, nobody even thought of it. No. Nobody, <laughs> there was nothing like that. So you were really you were really playing a lot of... You know, most games were played with a single umpire uh, in, in the 1890s, the major, vast majority of games. And... Um, and with, it, with the two umpire system, uh, nothing was really laid out for the two umpires as to as to who had what responsibility. They, they just basically got together before the game and just decided to uh, divide it up among uh, you know, the way they felt was best. If they were lucky, if they yeah. were lucky, and they both got into town uh, around the same time before the game, but they were coming by train. The trains were late. Sometimes one umpire wouldn't show up at all, and they had to call somebody out of the stands or use a player to umpire the bases. Uh, but in any case, the umpires uh, umpires often found themselves working with either complete strangers or players as their second umpire, and uh, they really couldn't count on them for much. Uh, they were lucky if they got you know correct calls on out or safe on the bases, and uh, they weren't going to get much help on controversial plays or judgment calls. No, it, no, uh, umpire, no, umpire was, <laughs> yeah, it was probably it was probably I don't know if there was a more brutal profession than uh umpiring umpiring uh professional baseball in the eighteen nineties. No, a lot of them uh, didn't last very long. They didn't. It was a very short lived career. And those who lasted were were pretty tough characters. Uh Tim Hurst uh was a very pugnacious guy. And he would, you know, he would, he would actually, you know, if a, if a batter questioned a strike or a catcher's question a strike, uh, Hurst said, well, why don't we settle this after the game, just between the two of us? And Hurst, uh, was a scary guy. And he, he, uh, uh, he eventually was thrown out, thro- uh, thrown out of the game, uh, in the first uh, decade of the 20th century by Ben Johnson when he was umpiring in the American League. And he uh, spat it at uh, Eddie Collins, second baseman for the A's. And uh, that was one too many for Johnson. Johnson fired him. He never umpired in the major leagues again. But the other umpires, uh, they took players, they, they fought with players underneath the stands, and they, they went at it even in the game. Uh, you know, Tim Hurst hurled, had a pop bottle hurled at him uh, in, in the game at Cincinnati. And promptly picked it up and threw it back in the stands and hit a guy in the head, a fan in the head. And the fan called the police, and 
the police actually dragged Hearst off the field and he spent the night in jail. Uh, that was that was the, that was the way the game was played then. And as Al said, the Orioles were masters at it. They played they played rowdy ball, dirty ball, and the Spiders were right behind them. The Spiders the Spiders openly filed their spikes before the game. Uh, there was, you know, there was all kinds of stuff that went on that you know fans today would. Uh, who were used to a very sanitized version of baseball in comparison to the way it was played then. Uh, yeah, could you but, discuss the, uh, you know, the fact that the National League was a monopoly and, uh, uh, you know, as monopolies usually do, they suppressed the uh, players' salaries, which, of course, led to uh, a good number of them jumping over to the American League when that came into existence. Yeah, at the end, as, as the century drew to a close, salaries dwindled. Uh, and, um, then when the National League after the 1899 season cut back from, uh, 12 teams, they decided this is just too unwieldy. We've got too many weak teams like Cleveland, uh, after which it had been decimated by its syndicate ownership. Uh, it, you know, it only won like 20 games in, in 1899 and just horrible teams. And as a result, the National League locked off four teams after the 1899 season and set itself up for a rival team to form. And Van Johnson, who then had the Western League of Cincinnati Sports Writer, uh, changed his name to the American League in 1900. And at the end of the end of the season, decided the National League was ripe to be threatened again by a, a rival major league and, and declared the major league a major league himself pretty much with a few mo- f- support of a few of the owners. And then they began to raid the National League uh, for its talent. And, and they drew many, many talented players. Well, as far as I, yeah, I can remember outside of uh, the giant owner, Andrew Friedman, who was in the class by himself, uh, that the uh, Arthur Sullivan who owned the, the Boston and John uh, Rogers, who owned the Phillies, they were the teams that were uh, most severely hurt because they lost everybody. They lost everybody. They, yeah, they were so. Th- th- those own, two owners were uh, uh, yeah. particular tight weights. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know that the, besides the Cleveland St. Louis indication, the other uh, ones that were uh, uh, Brooklyn the game with Brooklyn and Baltimore and the uh, Louisville Pittsburgh. Uh, yeah, Louisville, Louisville, Pittsburgh was a more clandestine uh, syndicate ownership, and, and it really neither team was that strong in the late '90s. But after the '99 season, Louisville was locked off, and rather than its players being declared free agents, uh, the syndicate uh, ownership really emerged because all the top Louisville players were funneled immediately to Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh. From a second division team, uh, for the most for most of the 90s, became a very formidable team in 1900. Two, uh, of, the, yeah, two of the players that came from Louisville were Honus Wagner, who was the, by far the dominant player in the National League during the Dead Ball era, and uh, Fred Clark, and, and a couple of pitchers, namely Jack Cheeseboro and they got J- Jesse Tannehill and, yeah, and you know, Tommy Leach, I believe, came from them also. Tommy Leach, uh, they, you know, they, uh, and Claude Ritchie, you know, they picked picked up several really fine players from Louisville, and they became uh, the chief contender for the Brooklyn team. When Brooklyn had riddled uh, in syndicate ownership, uh, Baltimore was not considered as big a drawing power as as Brooklyn, so the uh, syndicate ownership transferred all of Baltimore's stars, like, Jennings, McGraw, Kelly. No, McGraw didn't go there. McGraw and Robinson refused. McGraw and right. McGraw yeah. and Robinson refused. They were the, they were they were targeted to go to Brooklyn. Yeah. They refused. They refused to go to Brooklyn. So, uh, in return, uh, uh, McGraw is allowed to stay in Baltimore and be the, become the player manager of Baltimore. But from a you know an in, from a contending team, Baltimore became a very good team, but not a. Con- not a not an actual contender in 1899, and then it was lopped off. It was among the four teams that were lopped off at the end of the season. Well, Brooklyn and, won the National League in the, both 1899 and 1900, and they yeah, had meanwhile, uh, uh, that and Joe Kelly and uh, Willie Keeler, and I believe Matt Hanlon has taken taken over as the manager. 
uh, I think after 1900, or maybe before. Maybe he went he went in the uh, in the in the uh, syndication. Yeah, yeah. But Keeler is an, Keeler is an interesting case because Keeler, when we talked about players who were like Hamilton and, and Duffy who were affected by you know foul bunts being now declared strikes, uh, Keeler was not really very much affected because Keeler really he was a very small guy didn't have any power choked up in the bat so it was very difficult to, to for the umpire to determine was Keeler trying to bunt or was Keeler swinging away because he choked so far up in the bat so Keeler didn't have these foul these foul bunts or swinging bunts they were really swinging bunts because Keeler was famous for hitting them where they ain't and where they ain't was not over the fence. Where they ain't was between two infielders or between the pitcher and the, and the catcher or, you know, he very, very seldom, uh, got a, uh, extra base hit. So Keeler wasn't affected until, uh, by the foul, foul strike rule at all until the actual foul, the, the foul strike rule we know today came into existence after, you know, after the 1900 season. And foul balls now in, in beginning in 1901, foul balls of any type were ruled strikes with less than two strikes. And his average shrunk correspondingly very quickly. And from a, you know, one of the, one of the superstars of his era, he became just a very, very average player for the second half of his career. Most of think, it was. Do you think these sitting, these, uh, the 1890s statistics should be looked at, uh, uh, yeah, differently because of the fact that there was no uh, uh, foul strike rule during that era. Yeah, well, there, you know, but but of course we have to consider the fact there was no foul strike rule in earlier eras either in the yeah. 1880s and the 1870s. And uh, what it's really it, it's still a puzzle why uh, when the, when the pitching distance was lengthened and and the uh, rubber slab was installed prior to the 1893 season. Why averages didn't jump in 1893, but rather it, 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 the impact really didn't hit until 1894. The 1894 season was was one of a kind. The only other season even approaching is the 1930 season, when of course the ball was livened up and there were all kinds of other stuff went on to, you know, during the you know at the early in the early days of the depression to try and bring fans as many fans into the ballpark as possible, and they thought scoring would do it. Well, the scoring did of, do it. The scoring, scoring, of scoring season, season was the uh, uh, 1930 Phillies, who uh, had 315 as a team and uh, uh, and uh, won 52 games out of 154, and uh, the team had an ERA of uh, 671, which is still the uh, highest team ERA for a season. And, uh, and yet... And they... And they, they and, at the 1894 Phillies were, yeah. and they won more games, and they were, but they had a team batting average of over 340. And wow. as, as, as we talked about, they had four outfielders hit 400. The pitching uh, must have been pretty bad. The pitching was bad, yeah. uh, but it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. And it really wasn't as bad as some of the other teams. Uh, the the ERA averages in. Uh, you know, the, he, the leader, uh, Amos Rusey, had a very, very, you know, his ERA average that season was well over three. And he led the league in ERA. And a teammate of his, uh, Joe Meekin, had, also had a good, ER, a good ERA comparatively. That, and the Giants were the only team that had decent pitching in 1894. The Orioles, for all their strength uh, in the outfield and the infield and Wilbur Robinson catching, uh, usually had mediocre to less than mediocre pitching, even during this, even during their pennant run in '94, '95, and '96. They did have a guy named a guy named Bill Hoffer, uh, who was the last to win 30 games as a rookie, and uh, he had a couple of very good seasons. But for the most part, their pitching was very ordinary. And, yeah, I read uh, a biography uh, that came out a number of years ago uh, uh, by a man named. Uh, Read Browning on Cy Young, and one of the things that struck me is that he put in a biography that uh, Cy Young, who came in, uh, I believe, in 1890 uh, or 91, uh, hated yeah. every rule change that was put in during his career, but he managed uh, somehow to adapt to, 
uh, to it, and uh, over his uh, entire career, really didn't lose effect in this. It didn't, and, it, and largely because Young was just super strong, physically strong, and uh, didn't get into. He didn't, you know, he he played for an ownership that was fairly laid back. Uh, he, and he played for, you know, he, he was definitely the star of his team. He never got in an argument. Rusi was also a great pitcher, but he was stuck with Andrew Friedman for his owner, and they had contract dispute after contract dispute. And Rusi sat out seasons as, as a holdout. His career was pretty much over before he was even 30, whereas Young's career went on until he was well over 40. And he was, he, he, Young boasted he never had a sore arm. And if you look at his, career stats you don't you don't see any evidence of a uh, season of where he, he was you know laid off for any length of time and he never got in disputes with owners never got in disputes with managers never he got never, in he was also uh you know he didn't have any really bad habits either no he didn't he didn't you know he was a farm boy uh and he retired to be being a farmer after after he left baseball uh, didn't hang around the game, but still considered, you know, in Cleveland, he, you know, he lived in state, lived in Ohio all his life and would still come to Cleveland games and was, you know, given, given special days, special, you know, events were held for him and, uh, all, and, and he lived to be, you know, 88, I think he was 88, 88. past finally. Yeah. He lived a long time, was one of the last, last, uh, players, last significant players from the 1890s. To still, to still, still be alive. And, yeah, and uh, Kid Dickles was almost as good. In fact, if Kid Dickles hadn't uh, gone to the uh, minor league American Association for two years, he also would have won. He would have wound up with uh, 400 wins. He would have definitely, and he did that voluntarily. He did yeah. not go to the minor leagues because he was sent to the minor leagues. He bought a share in, in, in a minor a minor league Kansas City team, and he was living in Kansas City, and, and he. Uh, Bought a share in the minor league team and pitched there and managed managed the team, and then was enticed back to the National League and p- pitched a couple more years with the Phillies and Cardinals, leaving not going back to Boston, which as Al mentioned, uh, was under Bart, Arthur Soden's ownership and not a place where too many players wanted to stay once they saw they had other opportunities. That didn't and take Nick- very long for the. Uh uh, Boston American League team to take the spotlight away from the Boston National League team, which basically continued up until the point where the uh, uh, Boston National League team moved to Milwaukee. Yeah, yeah, they had very, very few good seasons. They had, they had two. They had a pennant winner in 1914 and a pennant winner in 1948, and uh, not much going on beyond that during the 20th century. Until the same moved. thing uh, almost happened in Philadelphia. If anybody was told, uh, you know, you were 1930 or 31 that uh, the Philadelphia would lose one team, everybody would have suggested it was the Phillies. But that yeah. uh, that didn't happen. The, the A's turned out because Connie Mack, uh, you know, was so old-fashioned in the way he uh, ran the team, and he never had any money to operate. And uh, yeah, he wound up, uh, they wound up moving out to Philadelphia after 1954, leaving the city to the Phillies, whose uh, history up to that point, uh, outside of the years that they had uh, uh, Grover Alexander uh, uh, pitching in the early teens, uh, was pretty uh, pretty uh, bad. It was pretty abysmal, yeah. And it was at the uh, 1890s. Now, this is interesting. The 1890s. Uh, a lot of teams had attendance problems with the 12-team league. Uh, and now you, you would imagine the team that drew, the teams that drew the best would have been the contending teams, Baltimore and Boston. That was not the case. The number one drawing team in the 1890s, and it, it could have been because of their, uh, their hitting, was the Philadelphia Phillies. Year after year, they led the National League in attendance in the 1890s. And of course, as we moved into the 20th century, uh, there were, there were very few seasons when either Philadelphia team at either major league in attendance, and uh, but in the 1890s they they had, they built a new ballpark in 1894. That's Baker Bowl, right? That's Baker 38. Ball. Yeah, yeah. The Baker Bowl it wasn't called the Baker Bowl then, but uh, it became the Baker Bowl after uh, the owner and owner Baker took over. 
but uh, they had they had the new a new park in 1894. It was a well appointed park for its time, and they drew well. They drew very very well. They were they were over 300,000 every year when other teams were drawing. You know, couldn't even break 100,000. There were you know most teams averaged maybe 1,500 a game home. Wow. Game. But the uh, and a lot of there were teams that averaged less than a thousand uh, per home. Yeah, well, this is what uh, uh, there was. I know there was a depression in the country in 1893. Started in 1893, and of course, in those days there was no uh, no night ball and in all probability no Sunday ball. No, there was uh, most, some teams. Most, the, yeah. the Midwestern teams in the National League and the American Association merged. Uh, the Midwestern teams, for the most part, tr- either introduced or tried to introduce Sunday ball, even though the National League had prohibited Sunday ball up until then. They, once the merger occurred, they began, they allowed it in cities where it was, it was legal. Uh, but certain teams like Cleveland struggled to get, introduce Sunday ball, uh, whereas St. Louis and Chicago had no problem introducing it in Cincinnati. Now that's why uh, the Robeson brothers, uh, who owned uh, both the uh, Cleveland and St. Louis team, shifted all the players to St. Louis because Cleveland would not allow alcohol or that, and they would not allow Sunday ball. In fact, I think there was, as you mentioned, uh, when we did the Indians a few weeks ago, there was a, uh, a situation where uh, uh, some of the Cleveland playing personnel were arrested because they tried to uh, play a Sunday game there. Yeah, yeah, that was frequently the case. The Cleveland American Association team had also struggled trying to introduce Sunday ball, even though it was legal in the American Association. Uh, they had to go to small, small, uh, beach communities outside of Cleveland that had baseball parks. Sometimes they only didn't seat more than, you know, 1,200 people, but uh, they would go there on Sundays and try and, you know, break through, but, even then, they ran into they usually ran into opposition and had to, you know, bag it for the year. And, and as far as Sunday games went, but okay, yeah, the, the 1890s was it was, a, it was a fun time to watch to watch baseball. Uh, you know, it really was because you all saw so all sorts of styles of play. Uh, you saw batters like Willie Keeler who choked way up in the bat. You saw people like Ed Delahanty who swung hard, swung for the fences, and. Uh, and you saw, you know, the introduction of really great players all throughout the decade. You know, that, uh, starting in 1890 with Cy Young and Kid Nichols, they both arrived the same season, and they became the two dominant pitchers for the next, almost the next dozen years. And then toward the end of the 90s, Hannes Wagner came up with Louisville, and uh, Matt Blagerway came up with uh with with Philadelphia, Philadelphia and interestingly, yeah. even though they're consi- some come, many consider them the two greatest p- players at their positions, second base and shortstop. When they came up, neither one was playing the position for which he became famous. No, yeah. was first baseman, and Wagner came up as an outfielder and played third base on occasion. He That's didn't play. Uh, it's so hundred years have, this year since Thomas Wagner played his last game, and he's still considered the best shortstop ever to play major league baseball. Yeah, he is. He is. He, you know, and, and the evidence is still there. I mean, you look back at his overall stats, uh, it's incredible. A man could have played as many games as he did at shortstop. And he didn't even play shortstop until, you know, he was almost, he was a third of the way through his career before he uh, actually moved to shortstop. Huh. And Lajoie, you know, second, with, with second base, the same thing. He, you know, he was, he, uh, he had a season in the 1890s. It was the best season during that decade by any first baseman in the National League. And they second you know, First baseman? He was, no, he was playing first base that Oh, time. wow. Yeah, and it's weird because if you look back at the, at the stats for the 1890s and say, this has got to be a mistake. Elijah Wayne never didn't play first base. He, kept, he couldn't have had the best season by a first baseman, and yet he did. And, uh, you know, he was an you know, exceptional ball player from the outset. And... And but you know every every team had a share of of guys you know good ball players who came up uh, because baseball was really really starting to explode all across the continent in the 1890s. They were getting players from California. Uh, they were getting players from the deep south. Uh, they there were always there was always a steady stream of players from the Midwest and even the 
even places like Colorado and and, uh, and Montana and you know. Well, the only they, source they had in the top that seems to be was the uh, uh, the black players. Yeah, they were the. They, yeah, that was. Yeah, that was always a tragic story. Okay, David, uh, I want to thank you for uh, the scintillating and informative uh, uh, talk on the night the 1890s. I hope that the people who listen to this uh, podcast get a sense of what what it was like and get a sense of uh, all the uh, uh, changes that were made in the game and get a sense of what it was like. Uh, uh, playing back then. I want to thank you very much. And uh, I, I, I hope we've induced some of our listeners to, you know, do, as Al has done and I have done to, you know, read biographies of the players, read about the game then, because it was, uh, even though it was a forerunner of the game we know today, in, in some ways that brought things to the table that uh, haven't seen, been seen before or since. I want to give David a plug before we uh, close. Uh, David is the uh, author of the uh, uh, first 19th century uh, Encyclopedia of Baseball, which has come out in two uh, two editions and is the seminal work uh, ever on the 19th century. Thank you, Will. And I'll give David a plug. You can get these books uh, if you're interested on uh, Amazon or maybe off eBay. But they're very, very worthwhile, and you learn an awful lot. So, again, David, I want to thank you for uh, uh, this uh, podcast, and I I hope everybody who listens to this appreciates the uh, effort and knowledge put into this uh, podcast by uh, the world's foremost authority on the 19th century, David Nemec. Thank you, Al. I really, really appreciate that. We'll be back next week, same bad time, same bad channel. Okay, I'm going to cut it off. Okay? Yeah.